Would you turn with me, please, to Matthew's Gospel and chapter 4? This young man, Yeshua, grew up and at age 30 began his public ministry. Indeed, in his full spiritual vigor, and when he comes out of the wilderness, the place of empowerment by the Holy Spirit, he announces, he makes a proclamation of some good news. We read about it in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, and verse 17. <clears throat> From that time... Yeshua began to preach or to proclaim, to announce, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first point I want to make to you is that before Yeshua begins his ministry, he undergoes the empowerment of the Holy Spirit we often lose sight of the fact that Yeshua was <clears throat> fully a man. We say that in our theological declarations. But I believe personally that when he walked around, he wasn't walking around as God in disguise. He certainly wasn't omnipresent. He was at a particular place on planet Earth at a particular point in time. And in some sense, perhaps evoked for us in Philippians 2, he emptied himself out of these divine prerogatives. He did not aggrandize himself based on his equality with God. But as a man, I think everything he did from his conception to his resurrection was done in the power, by the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't think he was walking around omniscient. I think he was led by the Spirit, he was anointed by the Spirit, he was conceived by the Spirit, he taught in the power of the Spirit, he healed by the finger of God, the Spirit of God, and he was raised from the dead by the Spirit of God. And then he begins his ministry once he has this empowerment. And remember, in so many ways, Yeshua is literally Israel's son. So many of the events in his life are paralleled to the life and the history of the covenant people Israel. So he comes out of the wilderness even as they came out of the wilderness. And he begins his ministry to the children of Israel, the sheep of the house of Israel. And he says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now let me make a couple of points here to set the stage to understand the most important aspect of Yeshua's teaching. The first point is this. I've already mentioned that behind our Greek Gospels, there is a Hebrew undertext, as it were, that the, the words of Yeshua were recorded very quickly after he uttered them, probably by the Apostle Matthew. And these, this collection of sayings later was translated into Greek and kind of reorganized and drawn upon by our Gospel writers. And we have extra-biblical evidence for that reality, for the church historian Eusebius tells us that according to the bishop of Asia Minor, Papias, Matthew, Levi, the apostle Matthew, wrote the first gospel in Hebrew. And he says the other gospel writers translated for their gospels. Jerome, I mentioned in one of our sessions, studying Hebrew, living in Bethlehem so he could translate the Hebrew scriptures into Latin, says that he actually saw the original Matthew's Hebrew gospel in the library at Caesarea Maritima. So there is evidence that this collection of Hebrew sayings of, of Yeshua existed for at least four centuries. But of course, as I mentioned, the whole world spoke Greek. And so these words of our Lord were translated into Greek so that the good news of God's kingship could go from uh, Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the Roman Empire. 
because all the known world at that point was Greek speaking. One of the great advantages, by the way, of the work of Alexander the Great, centuries before Christ, the unifying of culture and language. But the problem occurs when you go from Hebrew with all of its subtleties and implications and evocations, and you try to translate it into Greek. And we've already seen some humorous examples of how things don't always translate well, do they? Even with the best of intentions.